Thank you so much, Vili, for uh, bookending <laughs> this entire odyssey <laughs> that I just undertook. I sort of feel like your score here at the end, this very masterful, um, somewhat cinematic approach uh, score, is sort of like the bookend to my um, original video. So if if I am um, sort of stating the case in terms of concert music, and you are somewhat stating the case at the end in a in a more cinematic style, uh, but however you want to look at it, the score is masterful, and I think that it is probably more worth everybody's time to uh, <clears throat> for me to comment more on what it's doing rather than what it any perception of what it needs to do though I will have a few editorial comments for you as we go okay yeah so the the first thing I'm going to say just in terms of you know editorial I would say you can leave out the piano line um, I think both for me and for anybody else checking out your score okay and just just it, it gives me more uh, vertical space right and then that that way your stay your staff size can be just a little bit bigger right so um, that's that would be one possible thing So let's get started right at the very beginning, okay? And um, like so many other orchestrators, bum 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 da 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 dam. I like that little. I like the little um, uh, grace notes right in there. That's cool. I don't think that that was done very often, if at all, uh, by other orchestrators. And right in here, you've got. Um, it's kind of cool. You've got this. Um, you're coming in here, uh, flute three, uh, playing an octave higher. That's that's very very cool. And then here you don't bother swelling, right? You just let the instruments state what they're going to state. I would say that some nuances here in your first flute would probably be better. And I'd say in a concert situation, all you need is piano, dolce, ed espressivo with nuances. I don't think you need um, I don't think you need to boost the part so much um, compared to the other elements. I think it's I think that you'll get a way better quality of tone from your flute if you just leave it at you know at piano espressivo. Now <clears throat> I feel that this is a little unnecessary um, vibraphone with the um, with a little um, you know let vibrate um, un, you know un incomplete tie because like here you say damp so essentially the vibraphone's timbre will last for three beats right so there's really no need for you to um, to mark this in here right and then it just goes on and then you say to stop anyways when you're finished so it would be probably be better for you just to put a pedal mark under all of this vibraphone right in here right just put just put one long pedal and then uh, pedal up sign here and then that will you know accomplish then then here you know I think it would be better for you just to mark you know instead of saying you know incomplete tie uh, better just to score a um, a dotted half note, right? And then it will just naturally decay to nothing by right around here. And the same thing here, you have this big glissando. And the glissando will probably decay out by the right around here. There's no need to tell the, the harpist to stop the, tam the tone right here. The harpist will know. You know, there, the anything that would be hanging over from this glissando will just real, probably not be in evidence by the time you get to here anyway. Um, I would actually avoid m marking this in your harp parts. I, I think that the harpist, 
they're, this is really something that they use themselves. And they've got very keen ears, as you well know. You are, you're such a great harp, you know. You're such a great student of what harp can and can't do. So I would say leave it to the harpist. And then the same thing here, you know, we've got these um, incomplete ties. I think that it's it's better just to score this as a as a dotted half note. You know what I mean? And if this is really intended to last longer, just tell us how long, right? You know, half note maybe, and then maybe tying across. Um, yeah, and then same thing with your pizzicato in your in your double bass. I think you know it's it's sufficient to. I mean, right here you want pizzicato and you want sostenuto. So I would say mezzo piano, sostenuto, and then crescendo, poco a poco, and then just score your half notes. I think that's just a, a better approach to it. Okay, but that's just a picky little notation thing, and uh, I just just feel it's just more appropriate uh, for concert players. Okay, <clears throat> so let's just talk about what's really happening here. <laughs> um, we have the um, uh, syncopated uh, sense of unevenness right in here, which is really lovely. It's like it keeps the ear kind of guessing, and it's sort of meant to be um, a little bit indeterminate, right? And then we've we got the same thing happening here, fours against threes, right? And then fives against fours and so on, sixes against fives, and it just keeps the sense of motion sort of bustling in there. Um, then of course, uh, unmeasured tremolo, uh, unmeasured fingered tremolo in your uh, second flute uh, and some uh, your second and third clarinets and so on. And I like the doubling in here. That's, you know, that's nice. Second flute, alto flute, third flute, piccolo, uh, third clarinet, bass clarinet, and look at how it scored everybody in case people are wondering how this should be done. Really just separate staves uh, for those instruments that are going to be doubling. All right, it's just the just the easiest way. Of course you could mark like you could have just if the parts are uh, are integrated enough um, in terms of motion instead of uh, highly individualized like this then you can just put everybody on one staff you can have three flutes and then you can just drop in the doubling staves for the um, um, for your alto flute and uh, piccolo as needed right but this works too it just you know it just adds more okay so um, yeah so Ba da da dum and then da 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 dum. We, here we go to that octave, right? Now, now here, um, I, I would just mention one little thing, and and it's just a personal preference, really, and that is, I would always give the upper part to the um to the more experienced flute player, right? Even even in like the most professional of orchestras, um, so probably how I would score this is I would swap these parts, right? Even even if the first flute started off here, then just have the first flute jump up the octave and have the third flute play the lower part. That would just be my preference right in there. Um, just to have the, you know, have the most ideal tone, the most absolutely experienced person. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of my own experience with uh, New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. Um, all of their flute players, including the people who uh, do substitute work, kind of contract work, um, that like will come in when they need a third or a fourth or even a fifth flute player, they're all great. They're all top notch. But the principal flutist of New Zealand Symphony Orchestra is Bridget Douglas, and you will see her in the uh, woodwind courses that I've got. Um, anybody can go and look at for free over on Mac Pro Video. Um, you can, I think you can um, preview up to five uh, lessons a day, right? You know, and then it's like then the next day it sort of clicks over. Uh, but you can go look at her in, I think, Orchestration 103 and 102, okay? And her playing is just phenomenally good. 
it's not just a question of being competent, right? And and saying, well, you know, any great flute player could play what she plays. And that's true. But there's just something about it. You know, you just go listen to her playing. And then and then me then you'll understand with my with me being in this position of making sure that Bridget played this and then that she played this, right? E even just like the most the most subtle kind of thing just go listen to her playing and you see why that is the situation and and then why somebody might choose in any case to try to give the part that is the most prominent to the most experienced player okay you know even though i mean look it is great to give your third flute player or your second oboe player or something the occasional solo and that's all good but that's in a different context right this is the beginning of the piece this is we are setting the um the agenda the the mood, the um, the artistic statement of the orchestrator and of the original composer, right? So we want all of those things to mesh to perfection. All of this is fine. I like the the sh notice the shorter bowings. Everybody who scored really huge long bowings. Um. Yeah, and then yeah, just a little bit of celesta there at the end. This is all great. And now notice Vili used this little trick that I recommended that everybody use um, who wanted <clears throat> the violin to be able to hit that way high F sharp. And that is just to hold down an F sharp and then add the node to it, right? And that way we didn't have to have screechingly high piccolo or first flute. So beautifully balanced in here. Excellent scoring. Now, um, people have sort of seen me pick apart um, what I call harmonic mixing, right? Which is where like one one person's playing mezzo forte and the other's piano and then there's mezzo piano and there's this and there's that and it's finally just this big tapestry. Now, I'm not going to pick apart Vili score too much uh, in that particular regard because a lot of times what appears to be harmonic mixing is more um, like individualized lines coming and going, right? Now there are definitely, you know, admittedly parts right in here where the um, the horns probably could tone it down a bit, right? Like for instance, right in here, I would start pianissimo, you know, crescendo to mezzo piano or crescendo to forte in the other parts and let the brass be mezzo forte so you can get a better sound. So, um, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I think that they let there's more of a lesson here in terms of like what the instruments are doing, right? Like what is the what is the useful thing that I could say about this evaluation, um, you know, in terms of like what are the what are the players doing? And you know, I mean, in the spirit of how Vili himself will help out other people who need, you know, who ask questions with their orchestration. Um, in times when I can't, you know, when I'm just too busy doing projects like this, for instance, or um, there's really some massive stuff coming up for me and for you guys this fall, um, things that I feel I can offer you. And, um, you know, like when people step in who've got a lot of experience and you know, offer their, you know, offer their feedback. It's always really well appreciated. So, in that same spirit, I'm going to try to focus on what's um, what's important here. So, here we've got um, <clears throat> solo viola, um, and that is just really a lovely idea. You know, bum bum bum. So we're just really we're having the the um, the violas really come to the fore here in terms of expressing the important parts of the musical fabric right in here. And, you know, all strings plus some harp in here. So um, anybody who needs to jump back and listen to things again, that's that's right, go ahead. But like, you just notice how beautifully textured, exquisitely textured this was. And then we went to the core, you know, really like of what orchestra is all about, which is mainly the string sound, right? Now we've got bum bum. Now very a very very smooth way of stating this, right? Rather than the um, the mezzo staccato of um, 
of Lily's original score, but it works really well because of the overall smoothness and, you know, sort of suavity of Vili scoring at this in this opening. Really kind of curious, Vili, to see how you would approach next year's challenge to, you know, to sort of to see um, what your um, what your take on that material would be. Of course, I'm not I'm not going to say what it is, but it is a complete left turn from the mood of this piece. <clears throat> Yeah, bum, 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 bum. Here, I think, um, I think brackets. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I can see this as a sort of a shorthand, as non divisi but uh, it's not a universal thing yet. So you know, I would hope that this piece would get performed someday, and if it did get performed, you don't know who your players are going to be. So I would avoid the bracket and just use non divisi Right? I mean, especially if you're going to say divisi you might as well just say non divisi right? Now here you're saying, yeah, Sultasto or Denario. I mean, that's all good. Sultasto, non vibrato. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, okay. Bump, 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 pluck, pluck. I think you're already, you're already stating um, that it is that it is dry by adding the the staccato to it, right? So I think secco is a bit of an overstatement, right? I would just just say say pizzicato and have the st the staccato marks, or say mezzo forte secco, the place to to state it would be down here rather than up here, right? And then leave off the, so if you're gonna say mezzo forte secco, then you can leave off the um, the staccatos, but maybe express them as eighth notes might be the way to go. Okay, unison pizzicato. Yeah, and then once again, yeah, non, non divisi. Yeah, I, and Mezzo staccato with celesta and vibraphone. So here, what I what I would strongly recommend doing is is marking pedal uh, on this too. Just do a pedal lift on each one, so that the the players, both players, know that you are intending for them to use the pedal to state the mezzo staccato. I mean, there's kind of no other way to really do it, but but I would say, like, if you're going to, you were going to have to put a pedal mark here, so you should also do that here, just to kind of show, to guide the player, right? Yeah, and a little bit of triangle. And here's our reaction right in here. And I really like the, you know, the idea of the strings being answered by the, uh, by the winds plus pizzicato and bell-like percussion and keyboards. That's nice. Yeah, just basically flutes and and a little bit of um, little bit of oboe family. Now, ba da dun dun dun. Here, <clears throat> you're gonna need the um, the the horns to be pianissimo and the tuba as well in order to form a, a blend behind the uh, behind these low flutes, right? And uh, and a clarinet family. Yeah, because the, otherwise the horns will pretty much take over the um, uh, take over the sound picture. I mean, they're going to anyways, right? You've got a D sharp right next to a uh, right next to uh, A three F sharp in the flutes, and you know it could be A three, it could be A five, and the and a single horn will be like three times louder. So this really has got to come down to pianissimo. Right, and a little bit, you know, just being aware um, that this is going to sound a little bit like a telephone ringing, right? But I mean, who's to say? <laughs> who's to say that that's not part of the um, of the the story of this piece, right? How, well, how could it not be? You know, uh, if maybe probably probably doubtful that Lily had a telephone in her room 
at, uh, at, at the Villa Medici and in the year 1914. But maybe, you know. Uh, it, 1914 was a kind of a, you know, a kind of a strange year. I mean, the, the World War I just suddenly, just suddenly erupted. It was so quick, right? And, and I, I believe, um, you know, I'm not a big... I'm not a, a huge history expert, so I am I am surreptitiously, um, you know, sneakily looking that okay, yeah. So that it basically World War One started in July of 1914. So you know, if this piece, I think it was it. Does she say that she wrote it in March or something like that? So she could have pers perfectly, you know, feel like the world was beautiful and peaceful, and she was going to have just the greatest time. Um, you know, uh, doing the Prix de Rome in uh, in the Villa Medici. Anyhow, so it's doubtful that she had a telephone, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but but who's to say that it isn't part of the story somehow? But anyhow, it is going to sound a little telephone like. This is nice. So um, I'm going to just say my repeat my caution. Uh, to you, Vili, as as well as everybody else, that I I just want to, um, I I don't feel that that um, that it is a progression of notation uh, to mark the up arrow for the standard um, the standard roll. In fact, it's it's only you know it's only two notes, so it's almost it's almost better to write I would say to write a grace note, you know, but ing. Rather than a than putting in a roll, so I would I would actually just do a it, with this I wouldn't I wouldn't roll it I would do um, a grace note uh, tied on the bottom. But yeah, I don't I don't feel it's a progression of notation to have a to mark the up roll in the place of a default roll mark. Okay, um, divisi arco flautando whole tone trill maybe maybe better to just write the you know to have the like we're we're trilling maybe i'm getting this wrong wt trill maybe you're intending maybe you mean something else um but i would just i wouldn't worry about it because it's d to e right so it, the trill is going to be Oh, I see. So you you want to go right? You want to go F sharp to G sharp, G sharp, F natural to G natural, F sharp to G sharp. Okay, that kind of makes sense. I just feel that you should have separate. You should have different trill lines, and then just and then just add the sharp or the natural above the trill. For each of those lines, I think that's just the clearest thing for concert players, right? So, so I'm not going to <clears throat> dictate to you your level of, you know, communication with, uh, with the players that you usually work with as a professional orchestrator. But I would say in the concert situation, this might get a raised hand at rehearsal, right? You know, if you're working with, like, say, a regional orchestra or or even with a pro orchestra. I mean, I, I had one of my works played by a world-class orchestra they took one of my works on tour uh, was it four year, three year three or four years ago right and um i was i think six months after that tour i ran into one of the viola players and <laughs> he um I, I mean i could just tell by the by what he talked to me about was that there were raised hands in rehearsal, right? Because of like I had just not been clear enough, right? So they were, he was stuck on poco forte, which I felt it was very very clear that a way that I was using poco forte, um, in that to you know to mean just a little under forte, but not mezzo forte, which I I have stopped using by the way, just because you know for for various reasons I feel I've gotten past that in my scoring. Uh, I, I try to use a more simple direct approach now to my dynamics, which, um, which just you know, it's just as good as what is my original more nuanced. 
approach. But anyhow, <clears throat> the uh, the point was that like I could just you know he he started to talk to me about my score and says well you know I always thought that Poco Forte was you know Poco of the Forte and you know and, and I could just like I could say well you know it doesn't it doesn't matter like what level of player. I am I am working with you know that was like probably the very last impression I ever got about this but it doesn't does not matter what level of player I'm working with I could be working with the best viola players in the world and they're still going to ask me what the hell I'm talking about um, if there's any if there's the slightest deviation from the standard so I would I here I would say you know the standard thing to do is to have separate trill trill lines and you know, the first one does not have to say sharp on it, but the second one could say to could have a natural sign over it, and then the one following could have a sharp sign over it. So I would say that would be the way to deal with this, rather than saying WT trill, right? Uh, if if you're going to be working with even a world class orchestra, right? Um, that concert orchestra. All right, and then the same thing here, pizzicato. Just mark a half note, I would say. But you know, all of these little caveats aside, this is beautifully scored. Right, we've got this, you know, this just little flurry behind the, you know, da 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 da, and you notice that like, like this is this is a part that we saw this, you know, interpreted as massive two T's and and everything else. And right here uh, in you know in Vili's orchestration, it's actually very subtle. You know, it's not it's not overstated. It's just really, um, I mean, it has impact. No question about it, right? And you know, perhaps the downward glissando may be a little much, but yeah, but it but it still is, um, you know, it, it's it is it is not like taking over the music, right? And it helps to set this up. The only the only um, <clears throat> the only thing I would caution about would be, you know, similarity of dynamic arc similarity of you know to a small degree of color right but there's i mean you know when you're throwing the harp in there you've got oboe family as opposed to to flutes right it, it is enough of a difference i would say in there you know? and also leaving out the horns so ba -da -da -da. and then the pizzicato with the contrabassoon sort of simulating the um the you know, attack sustain sound of a piano bass note. It's really nice. Right. And, um, yeah, and once again, look, just, it's completely unnecessary to have these, um, you know, with a, with a concert harpist, just, um, you know, this will last for two beats and then that will, right, you know. I mean, I, I, I see what, uh, in, in essence that you sort of want this to wash through and you know like when this note is played you'll still hear the resonance of there but that's a standard thing for harp right and then here you don't have to tell them they'll they'll know to do their own damping all right um da 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 bum 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 yeah i mean this is really lovely right in here yeah, and, and look here. I mean, if you really intend, you know, this is this is like why I say I was going to avoid dynamic mixing, but I just thought I was going to point this out. Is that like right here, Vili really does want solo trombone right out in front of the orchestra, right? So this is how you would score it, <laughs> right? You get this rip and pop, right? Um, with uh, with these rips too, you know, mezzo forte sforzando, right? Mezzo sforzando. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's all, that's all fun. I mean, you just, you just have to accept that you, you're basically detoothing your, you know, you're, you're basically taking the, you're knocking the teeth out of your winds and, and, and strings right in here, and they will just, they'll just surge into it after as an afterthought right but uh, you know to point out that that it really does um keep the integrity of the dynamics here <clears throat> yeah it, it, and like right in here this is like especially where i would say this like the bra use of the bracket just becomes confusing because bracket can also mean to not roll right so the the concert player especially is going to prefer 
the mark non divisi here, right? Just which you only have to mark, which you only have to say once, right? Or as opposed to restating every time. Um, <clears throat> the only caveat I would say here, the only thing that possibly doesn't work, is this vibraphone in here. Um, it just is so likely that it will be um, that it will just be buried um, behind all of these winds, right? And also just the 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 overtones from the trombone will will just you know are will just be deadly to the uh, timbre of the vibraphone right in here. See, there's no problem here with the vibraphone because the vibraphone gets along. You know, it it's it is buddies with flutes and clarinets, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, like just listen to any old sort of jazz chamber scoring, <laughs> you know, and you hear that right away. Clarinets especially get along with vibraphone, but so do flutes, right? Um, what's an example? Um, the Roy Cooter, uh, excuse me, Rye Cooter jazz album um, has a um, has chamber jazz, really beautifully scored by an old student of my father, uh, Joe Hoffman or Joseph Hoffman. I believe is it is it Joseph Hoffman or no? What's his what's his last name? Um, yeah, he used to be um, one of my dad's students when my dad uh, uh, was teaching at San Bernardino State University. My dad used to teach German language studies. Um, hang on a second. I want to look this up just very, very quickly. Joe Bird, sorry, not Joe Hoffman. Joe Hoffman is uh, is a an engineer of mine that I used on a lot of recordings. Uh, Joseph Bird. Now, Joseph Bird is an interesting cat. He used to be the um, leader of the uh, the United States of America, <laughs> which was a uh, uh, was an underground LA band that actually got a recording contract and they actually got a major tour across the United States. I think they were supporting some other band and they sort of fell apart in the middle of their first tour because they're, I think they're, um, you know, the road life got to them and also their um, violinist um, was not, um, you know, felt like the band was getting too commercial and, you know, the lead singers were kind of screaming a little too much and, you know, they're kind of like an L.A. version of um, Jefferson Airplane. Anyways, a great, really great band all the same. We used to listen to the album all the time, which is kind of funny. And, um, yeah... All right, so back to this piece. Uh, sorry about the long, uh, the long diversion there, uh, but I'm just really enjoying myself. See, it's uh, it's I'm kind of cruising towards the end of these evaluations, and I'm just you know I'm just really feeling good. I was actually not going to do two evaluations this morning, especially since my son has got a soccer game in about uh, about an hour or so. But that's all right. We'll be done by before then. Okay. All right, and then Celesta here. Um, see, this works really great because you've got pizzicato strings and uh, staccato uh, upper winds, right? So the Celesta is going to come through beautifully. I would mark it forte, just in a concert situation, so it'll come out a little bit better. And, of course, what you'll get is mezzo piano, right? <laughs> or you could mark fortissimo, and you would still get mezzo piano compared to the rest of the orchestra, but it's still going to be fine. All right, now this is cool. Da 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 da. -da. <laughs> That's really really neat. Um, uh, the the way that the like so so why did Vili throw in three two here is because of the way that he wants the conductor to conduct this. You know da 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 da. So it's the you know along with the ritardando, it's like the beat. The conductor's beat is going to go here and there and there, right? And that actually is that is that is a nice way to divide things up, um, and just to really keep everybody to precisely together on what would have normally been the second beat of the second bar of the of these two bars. Now you're saying mezzo forte ma suave, so. If you do want that to be smooth, do you really want it to be separated, right? 
or do you want it to be slurred? That'd be my only comment about that. And then, you know, plus trombone. It's going to be very, very firm, but beautifully done right in here. Yeah, just everything works in here. My only concern here is <clears throat> is that the overtones of the of the horns right in here more than more so than the uh, than the trombones are going to affect the um, the um, the resonance of the flute right in here, All right? And you know also this yeah this this G is probably not going to be audible right in here in this in the second flute so. Um, you know, but I mean, if your intention here was that these flutes are basically just adding, um, adding, you know, there are sort of underlining the overtones of the brass in here, then it's cool. If your intention here is that the flutes are basically stating something unique in themselves and intend to be heard in their own right, then then you need to rethink, right? But I'm interpreting it as the first uh, possibility. And in that case, it would be very, very cool. Right, and then we've got our little resolution at the end, which pretty much everybody orchestrated their resolutions very nicely. Um, so it's funny, like I would I would work on things like this, you know, like three or four bars, and then we get to the resolution, I say, oh yeah, that's fine, and then move on to the next thing. Because pretty pretty much people were scoring things very nicely. But, you know, by having the flutes be part of the resonance of the brass before and then dropping them in here along with, you know, clarinet family and uh, middle strings, it works beautifully. Now we get to the restatement here. <laughs> da, 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 nice. Da, 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 da. Nice, um, nice emphases. I think that you could probably not slur across the downbeat here. Um, you know, if you're going to set up this pattern, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's better to have down uh, down bow on the downbeat. Okay, so down up down. That's all fine. Up, then don't slur across the downbeat. Down up down up down up right i think that just works better and you know what you probably get your parts back from a concert orchestra and see that this has been crossed off and this has been marked with a staple okay um <clears throat> so here we've got one of the interesting things here is is you know there was that sense of indeterminacy and fluttering and everything else going on in the strings um, at the opening statement, right? Now here we got the restatement and it's the winds that are doing kind of the fluttering around. And it's not as indeterminate as before, but it will still feel indeterminate to the ear, right? It's just like, you know, um, the ear of the listener is not that discriminating. Even listeners who are trained very well, you know, like um, I can choose as a listener or turn off as a listener, whether I want to like notice that things are, oh yeah, sex tuplets, right? But, you know, right in here, like sex tuplets against sep tuplets, right? That brings in the indeterminacy. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, and this is great. See, so this is not, this is not worrisome dynamic mixing because the strings are playing mezzo forte and the, winds are surging up to mezzo forte and back, right? Okay, so, but I would say, I would still say in here, like you, you, you must know the consequences of marking an accented mezzo forte horns in the middle of this surge, right? Is that you will hear the horns more than anything else right here, right? And the celesta will disappear. So, yeah, but having said that, the harp is gonna come through really nice. Yeah, I would, I would say, um, if you want this to blend mezzo piano, no accent, or mezzo piano accent if you must, but diminuendo to pianissimo. All right. Or, you know, just mark everybody up to forte in the, all the other parts instead of mezzo forte. Right, but yeah, but you're, you're gonna lose the celesta. You're gonna lose that celesta. 
Yeah. Yeah, and then right in here. Yeah, so I feel that it's probably, you know, I mean, it, it's <clears throat> some of these things I've been advising against would work fine just the same way that the flute would work on the previous page, like the, you know, bringing in like a sense of resonance, a sort of sense of color to instruments that are actually going to be heard uh, much, much more. Yeah, and, and the, the brass are just too, too, are just too beefy in here. I think that the strings would have to be, I think you, you should lose the accent and the strings should be forte by this point, right? And, and winds. Surge, surge to forte, go to forte here, or, or crescendo to forte here. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and then you know the restatement is keeps going. Da, 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 da. I really thought that this was nicely put together, you know, with the um, piccolo coming in, um, and the uh, first flute. I would say I would say don't make the piccolo optional, right in here. Make those notes um, count for something because of the drop here in the melody, the drop of octaves. Of the in the melody in the firsts and in the first flute. Okay, yeah, and then this is all really nicely done. Yeah, very, you know, somewhat heroic actually. I mean, it's very much tone painting that that you're doing in here, and it's, um, yeah, you know, it's a it's a much more direct kind of hands-on sort of tone painting, which I would expect no less from a professional film orchestrator. Um. You know the the um, I mean you really do have to be hands on with some directors and with some kinds of films. <clears throat> you know you have to you almost have to tell the um, audience where to look sometimes or what to feel or where or set things up emotionally so that the impact of the of the climax of the scene is much more potent, right? So <clears throat> that's a little bit of what's going on in here. Uh, really be aware that mezzo forte accent crescendo to fortissimo in the timpani basically means that there will be no nobody will hear this celesta at all right in here i mean let alone the strength of the of the brass in here so i mean yeah i mean in a in a session um this could be mixed in with no problem but i, I feel that here it's it's probably unnecessary all right so now we're getting to part c uh, ba bum 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 which is uh bass clarinet uh doubling the cellos or excuse me excuse me sorry bassoon doubling the cellos cantabile with cello so all right so notice this um everybody uh this is the way to do it right if you want you have two instruments like or you, if you have a wind instrument soloing that you want you know you just really want the player to <clears throat> to blend in with the you know with a with a, a string group then this is exactly what you have to say okay and that is that works really 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 great in my experience yeah and this is kind of neat and it's also really great that you don't overuse that right that little Right. Then later on, you do other things. Right. And then the, you know, the sense of uh, interweaving here with the eighth notes is really powerful. I feel then, you know, you've got your celesta coming in pianissimo or triple P. Uh, right. You know, mezzo forte diminuendo to pianissimo, very similar to the way you get attack and then sustain on a piano. Yeah, so just very conscious, very conscious scoring, right? And once again, no problems with dynamic mixing here because these are these are separate parts that are have separate functions that are interacting, right? So that's all worked out really nicely. Right, and you know, all you need is one single horn. Now, once again, um, you know, just thinking about my experience of listening to players and, and working with orchestras and so on. Um, you know, Sam Jacobs is like one of the greatest horn players in the world. And he lives here in Wellington and he plays for New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. And I know 
that you know if I were working with you Vili on this score and it was going to be performed by them then you know as your coach I would say give this to Sam I mean their third player is fine but Sam is out of this world right okay um, yeah and then yes a similar kind of decay you know quick decay um, simulation of the uh, of how a piano works. Okay. Yeah, and this is all just lovely, you know, uh, harp, a little bit of Glock as well. This is this is totally unnecessary, by the way, in the Glock. The I think all you need to, need to do is just say piano sostenuto. Right, you just save a lot of save a lot of um, people lifting their glasses. Lifting their glasses to take another look at the uh, <laughs> at the uh, um, at the score to take a closer look at their part, not not getting drunk. Okay, everybody. All right, yeah, and then this all works really nicely. And then last page, we're intensifying here. So you're saying first and third, that's fine, uh, and trumpet, right? So you've got your triple octave here. Yeah, pushing in. I think if you're going to go mezzo forte suave on your horns, push to forte in your um, start at piano and go to forte, not pianissimo to mezzo forte. With these uh, elements, see, so like, listen, the cats are meowing at my door, even though they just absolutely have no business being in this room. Okay, um, yeah, and then and then continuing to stack the instruments. Yeah, you know, how much will the flute actually add to this against the trumpet? You're saying piano, lontano, right? But you're going to get up to that A, like you're saying one, so straight mute into the stand. Yeah, I mean, you're doing reasonable things to control it. This this A is still going to sound almost mezzo forte. Even even muted and into the stand, but I, I see where you're going with this, and it's all right, okay, and yeah, just more sh more sort of shuddering and trembling from uh, from second flute and clarinets. This all works is all going to work fine, uh, and yeah, and then this little tuba, um, it's really lovely right in here, like the oboe kind of quacking away. Um, you got your harp, pizzicato. And yeah, and this tuba right under here, that just knocks me out. That's really, really great. All right, and then we've, we're getting to our last little compartment right in here um, of the um, sort of the, the four, those four sets of four bars. Now here, two soli, um, I feel <clears throat> that mezzo forte accent in the lower winds here is a little bit of a problem. I would come in here forte. That would be my compromise. And I would say don't accent in the wind. Right, and then we've got our little trembling winds right in here. And then, yeah, this is really, really neat right in here. So notice what Vili is doing. <coughs> Uh, he's having these overlapping uh, divisi seconds and violas um, un basically uh, playing off of the cascades, right? They're basically supplying that kind of top voice, uh, you know, right along with piccolo and, you know, then the oboes underneath. And this is kind of using something that I've lectured on extensively, and that is the um, the relationship between piccolo and oboes. Um, it's really, there can be a really wonderful combination um, of those timbres. Now here, the piccolo gets kind of low, right? So um, it's kind of getting into a weaker area just as your English horn and your oboes are picking up. Um, they're kind of picking up a, a firmer, 
more pronounced timbre right in here, just as your piccolo is getting weak, right? So, like, I mean, so what can you do? I would say, um, just basically, ugh. I would trade off right here. Just have the piccolo start trilling on its low E. And then have the first flute play, you know, B, G sharp, E. Because I just feel otherwise just the, the balance just goes away right here. This is all really lovely, by the way. Celesta right in here and, and everything else. But, yeah. But I just don't, you know, unless you really put a, a severe diminuendo right in here uh, with uh, oboe and English horn, I think that that it's going to fall apart a little bit in terms of balance. The piccolo will pretty much just start, start to disappear, and that's a shame because it's the top voice, right? Right, And, and the pungency of these uh, double reeds is also going to affect the audibility of these divisi middle strings right in here. Okay. All right, and then finally we get to this ending. And, you know, once again, you can sort of see the benefit in deleting these staves uh, next time you do... Um, yeah, I'm just sort of trying to imagine, like, what what will be your approach <laughs> um, for the next selection. So, like, if, just getting rid of the getting rid of the uh, piano bars, I think is is gonna um, getting rid of the piano bars. Now that sounds like San Francisco in the uh, uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, just as as an aside, there was a um, <clears throat> there was this really successful piano bar. And um, the people who um, who invested in it, um, they got a little extra money aside, so they bought the entire building and they built luxury apartments above the piano bar, and they they marketed them to people who they thought would want to go to this piano bar, really exclusive piano bar. They had top acts from all over the country, you know, coming in there and doing cabaret jazz. And I was actually a part of the cabaret jazz scene at that time. And what happened was the people moved there and then all of the people got together who had bought the apartments and they closed down the piano bar. San Francisco for you. Okay. Um, so now, um, <laughs> Tutier, Unison, Poco Espressivo. That's all cool. You know, this doesn't need to be mezzo piano. It could just be piano espressivo. It'll be fine. It will fit in. Bum 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 bum. I don't know. I don't know if this needs to be divisi. It's a really easy um, double stop. Yeah. You know the the only thing that I would say here, um, Vili, is maybe. Maybe there needs to be some doubling in this part. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got your Celesta in there. You know, maybe... Maybe your first... Maybe... Uh, Maybe your piccolo could be trilling on its low F sharp, right? It was the same as this F sharp, right? And then, yeah, and then you don't need this D here because it'll be played by the first flute. Now, see, that's that would, that would be the way around that, yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I just feel with the... Um, the uh, uh, exquisiteness of the background right in right in there and you know and I mean mezzo piano on your mezzo piano so mezzo forte diminuendo to pianissimo yeah so you you're gonna need some doubling on that melody there All right and I think that the the um, you've you've established a practice of mezzo forte diminuendo across uh, like okay and i think here you need to um you need to reset the emotion right here right so instead of just emulating that same thing i think here you can just go to calm and just piano accent diminuendo to pianissimo okay 
rather than mezzo forte. And then this will balance, but I would still want the first flute to double the um, the firsts right in here. And this is all nice. Yeah, this is just, yeah. Yeah, and then... Bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. I've already commented on how um, tubular bells get absorbed by uh, elements around them, right? So it's a little problematic with horn, right? Because horn will tend to try to absorb some of what's going on in the tubular bells. But it'll still work. Maybe, you know what? I would say mark the, the horns piano right and piano solo you don't have to do parentheses solo just piano solo and then i think it'll it'll blend beautifully with the bells right in there yeah and then it all just sort of floats away right at the end yeah so just really lovely scoring in here uh Vili. just just hugely enjoyable to look at this and to kind of really see just the you know um just really feels like like the you know the final crashing of that the crest you know we sort of had the crest of the wave building over the past half dozen uh excellent um very polished entries and you know and then this one just really kind of caps everything you know and and by in saying this i'm not saying that billy's um uh entry here is better than one or better than the other but it is uh you know it is definitely a place where he and i can have a meeting of the minds um you know in our professions as orchestrators and and also there's a certain kind of culmination of everything in this score i also feel you know which is completely accidental and and to be completely honest it has you know, if um, Vili's first name were Arna or something like that, then like he would have been the first person in this list. So it's just completely the accidental, you know, alphabetization of first names is why Vili is is the last person. And I'm going to sort of change around these um, these systems a little bit uh, from time to time, just to just so that things aren't so unfair to people who have, you know, a later alphabetical letter in the you know yeah you know in the first letter of their name but still it just yeah it just felt really really great for this um i feel like there's a certain sense of finality to this uh orchestration and that's good because i would say you know despite the fact that <laughs> i really enjoyed every step of the process i this is probably as much as i can evaluate and you know i i'm pretty sure that the uh, the um the reason why I got 146 entries is not because the website is becoming more popular or the challenges are getting around more or anything like that. I mean, I was anticipating, I would say like in a regular year, I probably would get maybe 100, right? Not 146. So I was anticipating 100 actually, and I was really pleased that we got higher. But, you know, I mean, it, it did take more energy and focus from me, but I was, you know, I was happy to give it because that's what I promised to do and, and you know. Um, but this prob this is probably as much as I can do, <laughs> you know, like around 150. So, uh, you know, there might have to be a cap in future years. And seeing as how the next entry is going to be a bit, just a bit longer and a bit more complex, there might have to be, you know, further kinds of limitations. But I don't think it will affect anybody's fun time if they are dedicated orchestrators and they really are into this and they have a history with it. And, and even if they're newcomers who are really enthusiastic, there will be a place for everybody. So um, those are my final words on this score. I really enjoyed it. Everybody should just jump back to the beginning of the video now and uh, have another listen and another look to the whole thing. And uh, there were just countless little things that I didn't get a chance to talk about. Uh, little beautiful little touches in this um, but I will just leave those for you to comment on in the comments below and seriously everybody um, <clears throat> just because it's taken me a little bit more time to get to the last dozen entries you know the last few videos and so on 
Um, doesn't mean that there shouldn't be just as many comments on these last few videos. Um, that just, you know, please, please comment, view, like, give these people some feedback, even if it's just saying, hey, I really like this, or hey, it really made sense to me, or, you know, why did you do such and such at bar 45? You know, it, those, those things all really make a difference. And I would say, especially, especially in a case, you know, like with Vili or with other people who have really spent a lot of time in the community trying to help people. I mean, you kind of owe it to them to to help them back, you know? Even if it's just uh, even if it's just like a like or or a, or a nice little comment, you know, it just would really make a big difference to me, not not just to them, but to me to know that this experiment is working. Right? So, thank you Vili. Thanks everybody watching and, you know, and and you know, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I'm so grateful to everybody who is supporting, uh, who's been supporting for so long on Patreon. Uh, Vili has actually been there from uh, practically the very beginning, I think, and and um, you know, it's just always been really supportive and given me advice um, on the back channel from time to time. That just really is appreciated, and um, yeah, and and so uh, just thanks everybody. I'm so grateful to you all for participating and I think I'll have another little video um, just a, a few final thoughts um, and then it's back to the WC which I'm really looking forward to producing and releasing before the end of the month uh, we'll have three more lectures on the first movement thanks everybody see you soon